are in the wilderness. As you can see here, there is no civilization. There is nothing. There is only me, a lonely knight who must go on a quest to bring uh, civilization back and leave the magical forest. How will I accomplish this, you ask? I'm glad you asked. I will be going on a knight's quest today to make some fancy bread for the lord of the manor in order to prove my bravery and courage as a knight and rejoin society. Come along, let's go! I have bartered with Sir Hannaford and I have acquired the necessary ingredients to complete my task. The forest. The bridge between the forest and civilization. I have returned to civilization. All right, so we are back in the very um, medieval kitchen. You can see before you, the plan today is to make pandemane. It's based off of a recipe from Good Cookery. Essentially, it's a bread, it's a white bread, uh, fit for the lord of the manor. Back in medieval times, more like white refined breads were very much indicative of a higher social class, while the more lower class breads are made of uh, more whole grains such as oats or rye or like uh, more like brown uh, wheat flour. Today, we'll be making fancy bread. Now, uh, there are a few in, like, interesting additions in this recipe that one would not see in a typical white bread, like, modern day recipe. The first being scalded milk. Now, a, this milk is being used in addition to just water as a liquid for hydrating the dough. My only guess is that the milk is to impart more flavor. And the reason that it's scalded, my only guess is for um, getting rid of any bacteria in the milk, cooking off anything that would be harmful. So now I have warm water. What we're going to do is we're going to put one packet of yeast in. Uh, the yeast is going to act as our rising agent. Um, and by putting yeast in the water, it's going to bloom it. Uh, what that's going to do is just going to make sure that the yeast is active. You can see immediately that this yeast is in fact active by the fact that it's becoming foamy. That means that the yeast is coming back to life and it's all good. We're gonna give that a few minutes to activate. Now we're gonna make, we're gonna get two cups of milk. This again is going to be for scalding purposes. Hopefully it'll make the bread taste interesting. I can't say I've ever made bread with such a high quantity of milk before, but it should be, should be good. Now we have our very hot milk. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pour it into our mixing vessel. and oil. We're going to just mix this together. Now we're going to add some of the flour to our milk mixture. We are going to mix that We're going to add our softened yeast mixture and we're going to continue to mix that. And we want to continue to add flour until we hit six and a fourth cups of flour. This is where it gets interesting because I am going to attempt to start kneading it. At this point, it's still pretty wet, but I still have a lot more flour to add, so it should be good. Okay. All right. Now we're going to just work the flour into the dough and incorporate it. Within the primary and secondary medieval texts that we've read in class, bread is highly indicative of social status. In Northern Europe during the medieval ages, bread was considered a precious food, a rare food, and a fashionable food. The introduction ahead of Good Cookery's medieval recipe for pandemane states that the average person on the whole did not bake their own bread. Those that grew grain and wheat would take it to a miller for processing, then take the flour to a baker. Others merely purchased their bread directly from a baker's stall or shop. 
We see this scenario play out within the romance of Tristan, where Tristan and Isolde are by themselves in the forest. In this passage, the narrator notes that they were troubled at being short of bread. When Tristan and Isolde are worried about losing bread entirely, they are simultaneously worried about losing their final connection with the outside world. Making bread cannot be done alone in the wilderness. There is no one to sow the fields, mill the grain, and procure the milk necessary. After the couple worries about the lack of bread, Tristan killed many a stag, hind, and roe deer in the wood. Where they made their abode, they could make a big fire to do their cooking, but they could only spend one night in each place. The couple is unable to make bread in the forest, symbolic of how they are unable to recreate civilization and societal order within the forest and must hunt and gather like that of their ancestors. If bread can indicate social status, then the lack of bread within the forest shows a lawless land where anyone can ascend to any position with little backlash. The bread creates a social hierarchy that Tristan and Assault have finally escaped by entering the forest. Back in society, those of higher ranks were able to eat higher, more refined bread. The pandemane, coming from the French word for pan, for bread, is made with a sifted white flour, which would have been expensive to procure in medieval times. Most people of lower classes and non-noble ranks would have eaten breads made from a darker or coarser flours, which were easier to come by and less expensive. There was also a tradition of nobles to eat their food upon trencher plates, or plates made from bread. They would not consume the plates and instead just eat what was on top of them. Once the meal was finished, with the dripping seeped into the trenchers, the bread plates would be given to the poor as a form of alms. In The Night with the Lion, we see a role reversal in who is giving bread as alms to who. As in the romance of Tristan, we see someone of a higher rank, Yvain, in the forest away from society. Hungry, he encounters a hermit, who in any other scenario would have been the person of lower ranking asking for the bread. Instead, we see that out of charity, the good man, the hermit, took some of his bread and his fresh water and placed it on a narrow window ledge outside his cottage. The other, Yvain, craving the bread, approached. He took the food and chewed it. I do not believe he had ever tasted such hard, bitter bread. The book Medieval Tastes, Food, Cooking, and the Table speaks to Yvain's experience with the hermit's unappetizing bread, stating that bread made of wheat represented a luxury product throughout the Middle Ages, and it was precisely to reject this luxury that hermits chose to deprive themselves of it, replacing it with a barley bread having a clear penitential intent. This bread was little appreciated because of its sour taste and was considered barely digestible because of its reduced gluten, which did not allow for complete rising. Hermits, in removing themselves from society, intentionally deprive themselves of bread. In doing so, they have identified that bread plays a key role in society, and as they want no part in society, they remove this key factor, this bread. Once in the forest, the strict hierarchical roles of society are removed, and bread becomes a much more flexible substance than out of the forest and inside the castle. Inside the castle, there's a strict order of the nobles eating white bread, their meals being placed upon trenchers, the trenchers given as alms to the poor, and non-nobles eating more whole grain breads. But in the forest, none of these rules apply. Bread tells our story, and out in the wilderness, it has a different story to tell, one not limited by the makings of civilization. We have our bread. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take it out. We're going to punch it down. And we're gonna let it rise again. The bread has around doubled in size, as you can see here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each one out. I'm just gonna make it more into like a loaf shape. I want it like a little longer. This. And go back in. I'm going to score it uh, just down the middle. This will hopefully make it look aesthetically appealing. Yep. Very exciting. Now these will continue to rise briefly just until the oven is ready and then they will go inside until 
They're done. So, here we go. So it's been 35 minutes. I'm going to check to see if the bread's ready. In order to check if it's ready, you're supposed to tap it, and if it sounds hollow, that means that the bread is cooked. That sounds pretty hollow to me. Try not to burn myself. Those look like breads. Yeah. All right, it's time for the most important part, the taste test. It's looking a little doughy on the middle, I'm not gonna lie, the bread is still a little warm. I have been carrying around this packet of honey with me in my bag. I feel like this is something that the medieval people would have had access to. that the milk would add a little more flavor to this. It has a very nice crunch. As I said, very doughy. That could be in part just due to possibly proving conditions being not um, ideal in this environment. Just because of the temperature. As you can see here, it's very much a doughy kind of bread. I would say if I was a lord in evil England, um, I would be very much impressed by this bread. It has very white uh, sifted flour that would have been really difficult to get a hold of. As like your clothing in the medieval times, arguably equally as important in showing status uh, would have been showing off what was a dinner plate. Um, I think this would be an impressive contribution to add to it. I would definitely recommend this recipe.